Hi everyone, welcome to the technology access and equity discussion for um, May 1st um, for our online class for ISTC 741. Um, we're going to be looking at three specific readings addressing uh, the digital divide and how technology provides ac uh, access and equity um, within kind of social conditions um, within our world and with our societies. So our first reading that we looked at was the NTIA report. Um, this, at, in, as you're looking through, you'll notice that this was actually um, a survey conducted by the Census Bureau. Um, it's, there were, this is actually the one that we read was the first of, or excuse me, the third of three surveys. Um, the first two started in 1995, and then the collection of this data was taken from 1994 to 1997. Um, and really what they did is they surveyed 48,000 sample homes um, in 754 geographical areas looking at um, pretty much internet usage um, and computer usage at home and accessibility to those things um, and how that is affected, the usage is affected by race, income, degree of urbanization, education, and just access in general. Um, one of the reasons that they provide for really doing this study is that as the digital environments are growing, um, this is becoming not just a, um, a hardware issue, but it's becoming an economical and a social issue, um, which, is, which is what kind of is a consistent theme without, throughout all of our uh, three readings. Um, but that was kind of their big idea behind the, the looking at the digital divide to address kind of these economic issues that will eventually arise. So they chose to, and I've highlighted it here in pink, um, they looked at information and provided data on level of access by Americans to telephones, computer, and the internet. Um, they looked at where Americans were gaining access, um, whether at home or in different locations, and what they're doing with their online connections. Um, and one of the big things to note is that this study is done in 1999 and how different um, internet was in 1999, um, how computers, home, home usage of computers was different, um, just reflecting back to that piece. Uh, this is uh, some of the interesting data that they pulled out from um, their introduction, and I kind of highlighted the big um, pieces that they brought up. They discussed um, the differences between information rich people and information poor people, and those that are typically on either sides of the divide. Um, those with access are typically um, of white or Asian Pacific Islander ethnicities. Um, they typically come from higher incomes. Um, they usually have more education and they come from dual parent families. Um, and those um, typically on the digital divide side of lacking resources are typically younger, um, of lower incomes, of less education, they're typically of a specific minority, um, and they're usually in rural areas or within central cities. Um, and two of the statistics that really stood out were the fact that an urban household with an income of 75000 or higher is 20 times more likely to have access to the internet than rural or lowest income families. Um, and they're also nine times more likely to have a computer at home. Um, and one of the things as I was looking through this study of, of noting why the first part really focuses on household access to phone lines, um, and I didn't really connect with that because I was like, okay, well, why do they need a phone line? Why are they so concerned with this? But then thinking about to 1999, how did most people access the internet through dial-up internet? Um, and therefore, it was necessary for people to have, um, have phone connections to their house, hardwired phone connections. Um, the other um, big part that I thought was a, a really big deal was that um, African Americans or Hispanics were a third less likely to have internet um, as Asian or Pacific Islander households and uh, two-fifths less likely than whites, um, which definitely shows the divide, um, not definitely within ethnicities, but also within um, some of the other variables that come into play. And one big thing that they did talk about a lot here was uh, CACs, which are community access centers. Um, and they really noted that these were, were used well by those who are lacking resources at their home. And a lot of times these um, community access centers, be them libraries or community centers, um, they were used a lot of times for educational opportunities or searching for jobs. 
for people that were considered information poor or lacking within um, digital resources. Um, last but not least, um, in looking at the digital divide article and defining it, um, one of the big stresses that they had was that, again, this was an, not just a um, hardware issue, but it was an economic and eventually a social issue. Um, and it says jobs in the new economy now increasingly require technical skills and familiar familiarity with new technologies. Additionally, obtaining services and information increasingly requires access to the internet. So the fact that the world is changing to a digitally platform world um, in order for Americans to be able to function, work, communicate, purchase goods, obtain information, in order for them to be able to function in this new digital world, they will have to, um, there will have to be some sort of addressing of the digital divide to try and close the gap. Um, and they bring up three big, uh, or excuse me, four big points of ways to bridge the gap. Um, they talked about increasing competition of service providers and pushing for universal service. Um, looking now, almost 20 years later, how that definitely does not seem we don't have universal service now, um, but looking and reflecting back of how that would potentially bridge the gap. Um, they looked at, they also suggested expanding community access centers. Um, and some of the big things are, that they really stressed was building awareness of technology's benefits. A lot of people gave the reason of why they didn't have um, certain technologies was because they didn't want them. Um, and this is probably why uh, they said that they didn't want them. It's probably because people don't understand why they might need it. Um, so just building awareness of why people aren't connected and why they should be and explaining to them the benefits that would go along with it. And last but not least, um, looking at addressing content and privacy concerns. And this is in 1999. Think of how much um, internet safety and internet privacy is such a hot topic now. Um, it was even a growing issue in 1999. So again, almost 20 years later, um, definitely still seems to be a concern. Okay, moving on to War Showers, um, reconceptualizing the digital divide. Uh, so this is a couple years later in 2002, um, and he kind of um, takes a different stance on looking at um, NTIA's typical um, conception of the digital divide and really being a hardware issue, um, and he believes that the digital divide needs to be reconceptualized towards a different framework that not just looks at the technology access, but also as um, looking at technology as a means of social inclusion um, and the ability of technology to uh, address social issues and um, to give certain groups that are typically within that divide um, access to um, certain benefits that other members of communities might have. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about a little bit in our discussion with this of whether or not he really gets at the fact if this is possible, if this is even possible. Um, one of the things that he brings up um, were examples of community technology projects. Um, he talks about, um, like for instance, he talks about the hole in the wall project. Um, he talks about um, some of the other, the town, uh, some of the other community projects and he says that they're often problematic because a lot of times hardware is just thrown at things without proper implementation. Um, and so he brings up the fact that technology should be um, accessed and used to engage in meaningful social practices. Um, it's not just providing the technology, but it's using that technology to engage into um, these social practices where we see that, um, you know, that technology can open up opportunities for social groups that aren't necessarily available without the technology or um, getting them to kind of um, be more involved in the community or or addressing some of these social issues that are coming up. Um, and he says one of the ways uh, to engage in these meaningful social practices and one of the ways to address this divide is um, kind of to look at the idea of literacy and how there are many different forms of literacy and how in the fact that um, a specific, looking at literacy as a specific set of social practices, not just the way we typically see literacy of, you know, uh, reading abilities. Um, however, really he's getting at the fact that if we address literacy 
in its many different forms, um, looking at it through uh, physical resources or digital resources or human resources and social resources, we can in turn use those kinds of um, looking at the issues related to those types of resources and kind of use that in turn to affect our um, ICTs or our um, in looking at kind of our um, classroom practices or looking at our community practices or our um, computer technology um, that we have within the world. And so he kind of challenges a little bit of the ideas of, of NTIA and um, really looks at the idea of not just the digital divide being a hardware issue, but more so of kind of even what we read in last week's class of looking at it's, you know, there's m different barriers that exist and, and more so looking at technology shouldn't just be used to have access to it, but for the fact of um, engaging in meaningful social practices. Last but not least, we have more of a contemporary um, reflection from Selwyn on the idea of the digital divide. Um, and Selwyn's obviously was published in 2011. Um, but he brings up the fact, he kind of continues a little bit of where um, Warshower was going in the fact that it's not just um, a hardware issue uh, for the digital divide, but again, that if we address the, the, the digital divide, we are then able to um, engage in social practices and allow for um, people to overcome barriers of social constraints um, based on their class, their economic status, um, based on their um, ethnicities, um, based on their types of education. Um, so Selwyn really goes into looking, does the question of does technology make education fair? That's the title of his chapter. Um, and he brings up three main points. Um, he talks about the fact that technologies allow for um, personalized and individualized freedoms in education. However, he also brings up the limitations of them. So he really does promote the fact that technology does allow for people to have more access and individuality in their education, but he does also provide a critique as well. Same thing along the lines of he looks, he gets into this idea of social justice, um, similar to what Warshower does. Um, and he says that the design and implementation of technology can be used to promote social justice in education, um, looking at some of um, the deficiencies that certain social groups might have in terms of accessing education or um, using these uh, social kind of uh, practices, like giving, if you are given more access to education, that you'll be able to, in turn, affect social issues within your world. Um, so he brings that up, but then again, just like he did with the last point, he brings up the fact that there are limitations and flaws related to this. Um, and overall, he really says, despite efforts to address the digital divide, it is still ever present in today's society. Um, and so some of the things that I ask you to reflect on in the discussion are whether or not um, this idea of social justice or this idea of, um, you know, social learning or if, or if even society in its fact can be, can be addressed through technology. Can social issues be cured with technology um, or, or can they be addressed at all? And a lot of our authors kind of get into the fact that not just is this a hardware issue, kind of of what we looked at last week of people becoming too comfortable with the technologies, but is this, what are we looking, what are we using the technology for? What is its purpose? And in turn, is it affecting the way that we interact with each other in our world? And is it giving us the opportunity to interact with some of the social issues that we see going on within our world? Um, so if you guys are continuing the discussion, you should be going in and um, clicking on the webpage that I made that has the link to the discussion and it has some the link to some of the other resources. Obviously, you had to found you have had to have found it because you wouldn't be watching this video. Um, but I look forward to seeing everybody's discussions. Thanks so much.